Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started with our next panel. Hello, everybody who is here and to the people who are not here, who are watching uh, via uh, live streaming. Thank you all so much uh, for coming to this panel. Uh, the, our subject is Free Political Prisoners. My name is Margaret Kimberly. I'm from Black Agenda Report. And thank you. I'm also serving on the uh, UNAC Administrative Committee. Um, just a few, couple of quick housekeeping things. Um, uh, reminders, our Twitter hashtag is UNAC1, that's at UNAC1. Two hashtags, no new wars, and end war at home and abroad. <coughs> Excuse me, that's end war at home and abroad. That's what? <laughs> We're also live streaming on goproradio.com and cprmetro.org. Um, so, why are we talking about political prisoners? Uh, it's interesting because I think the average American uh, person would not even acknowledge that uh, there are such people in existence. But that's not surprising. Um, by now everyone knows, or ought to know, that the United States is the largest jailer on earth, with both the largest number of individuals incarcerated and the largest percentage of population behind bars with 25% of the world's prison population, but we only have 5% of the world's people. And those statistics are really uh, inextricably linked to the subject of today's uh, discussion. We know that mass incarceration began in earnest in reaction to the liberation movements of the 1960s and 70s. We know the war on drugs was a rationale for locking up more and more people. We know that the prison industrial complex uses incarcerated people to do more than just churn out license plates. Now they make everything from office furniture for private corporations to bullets and bulletproof vests and body armor for the US military. But mass incarceration and our incarceration system is in itself deeply political. It should not come as a surprise that there are people in this country held in prison because of their political beliefs and activities. The insidious thing about the United States is that in general they aren't charged with offenses that are obviously or overtly political. Instead, they're jailed on trumped up charges and trapped, received draconian sentences for minor offenses, or are victimized by informants who, who themselves concoct the alleged crime. Some are attacked by police and then charged with crimes when they defend themselves. So, but we've seen this for many years. The FBI's counterintelligence program was a result of the uh, freedom movement and the Black Panthers and others choosing to assert their right to self-defense. The SWAT team, every podunk uh, community in the country has a SWAT team, and they were developed as a result of a shootout between Black Panthers and uh, the LAPD in 1969. But lest we forget, this country was never friendly to the dissenter. Our people, we're told, are great. The past presidents, we're told they were brilliant or uh, wonderful, but they were slaveholders or they led genocide against the Indians or practiced wars of aggression outside of the country as well. So of course there are political prisoners here, and of course their number has grown. There always is a pretext for putting and keeping people in jail. It could be the Cold War, or the Black Liberation Struggle, or uh, an attack as happened on September 11, 2011. Now there are entirely new classes of political prisoners. George W. Bush invented the term enemy combatant in order to come up with entirely new ways to terrorize individuals, and then preemptive war, which destroyed Iraq. And his predecessor, or rather his successor, Barack Obama, has gone further. Bush claimed the right to indefinitely detain anyone who he said was an enemy combatant, but Obama actually claims the right to kill, including American citizens, and he ju did just that with Anwar al laki and his son. <coughs> so the fight to free political prisoners is part and parcel uh, of uh, what we're going through now uh, with the government, which is becoming more and more less democratic. There's nothing democratic about SWAT teams or the Patriot Act or COINTELPRO, which continues under different names. 
and they're part of a larger conspiracy to keep people from doing anything that allows them to truly change this system. But that's about it for me. We have a great lineup of speakers and our time is limited, five to seven <coughs> minutes speakers and we're gonna, we're gonna remind you. And I'm now going to uh, introduce my co-chair, Jeff Mackler, also on the UNAC Administrative Committee, many things, um, director of the mobilization to free Mumia Abu-Jamal. He's a former West Coast coordinator of the Lynn Stewart Defense Committee, and he's the author of Free Palestine and other books on US and world politics. So, Jeff Mackler. Thank you, what an honor to be here. I'm so glad Margaret pointed out that we are, we, the government of the United States, not us, is the number one incarcerator in the world with 7.3 million people under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system. Half of them are in jail, incarcerated, and increasing numbers are subjected to the privatized, for-profit, slave labor, average 50 cents an hour prison industrial complex where they produce prime products for the Fortune 500 for free. In Georgia and Texas, they work for nothing. We imprison, we have the largest number of people on death row in the world, and we are one of the few nations left that still has the death penalty. But we have another kind of death penalty called imperialism and colonialism, where through drone wars, privatized death squad wars, on the troop ground wars, sanction wars, embargo wars, and starvation wars, the United States government kills additional millions of people. <clears throat> In the society that we want to build, we will empty all of the prisons because everybody there is truly a political prisoner. In the society that we will build, there will be no police, CIA, drugs brought into this country in order to incarcerate people. 80% of the people in prison are there for nonviolent crimes. And those people who have been driven mad by a sick social system will be taken out of the jails, given first-rate housing, education, health care, opportunities to thrive and reach their full potential as human beings. We won't have any political prisoners in the world that we want to build. <clears throat> we are scheduled today to hear Skypes from uh, a number at least one, they said, and perhaps all of the Cuban Five. And we were informed by the government of Cuba that they are en route to other countries to speak. They are the heroes of the Cuban people, and they wrote to us to say that UNAC deserves to have the heroes of the Cuban people here, and I heartily agree. Instead, they sent a message which i like to read from you from the people of Cuba. Dear participants to the Conference of the United National Anti-War Coalition, UNAC, we convey to you our friendly salute on behalf of the Cuban Institute of Friendship with the Peoples and the whole of Cuba. The work, of UNA, the work UNAC does in the United States in the struggle for social justice and against military interventions in other nations is a topic of utmost importance today. The problems affecting the peoples of the world, among which we have unequal distribution of wealth, lack of medical assistance and education, unemployment, energy and environmental crises that put the very life of human beings at risk cannot be solved with wars, nor they, can, nor they cannot be solved by military interventions. Our country, on the contrary, what is really required is the strengthening of dialogue and cooperation among nations, peoples, and governments of the world with absolute respect for international law and the free self-determination of the peoples of the world. 
Cuba that has suffered military interventions, terrorist attacks, an economic embargo that is still in place has decided to build its own model of development that emphasizes the well-being of the people, the guarantees uh, that guarantees the exercise of the economic, social, and cultural and political rights of the people. Cuba is in the middle of updating our process of economic and social models. We aim at achieving a prosperous and sustainable, sustainable socialism for all our citizens. In this context, on December 17th, the governments of Cuba and the United States decided to begin the work of reestablishment of bilateral, bilateral relations, diplomatic relations. And the Cuban people received with joy the news of the return of the three remaining Cubans <coughs> in jails for fighting terrorism. The Cuban Five, Gerardo, Ramon, Antonio, Fernando, and Rene, symbolize the spirit of resistance of our people and the firmness of principles that support the Cuban Revolution. The decision of the Cuban government of, to begin talks with our government, uh, with the United States government, without Cuba making any concessions of principles is due to the resistance and strength of our people, which for over five decades has built a social project each day more just and inclusive. Nonetheless, in spite of the fact that we consider as positive the steps taken by the current U.S. administration to improve relations with Cuba, the economic, commercial, and financial blockade against the island remains and constitutes the main obstacle for the development of our peoples. We will continue to fight to end this hostile and unilateral policy against Cuba together with our friends in the United States and with other peoples of the world Finally, we wish you a productive debate conducive to strengthening of the work of your organization, Kenia Serrano Puig, ICAP President. Thank you. I have a motion that we accept Cuba as an honorary member of UNAC. Do I have a second? All those in favor say aye. All those who say no. It's unanimous that we will communicate that to the NSA. <clears throat> we have now joined the League of Organizations on the U.S. Terrorist List, supposedly. And if Cuba is a terrorist country, we live on another planet. Let me tell you about revolutionary Cuba. I went there as an American socialist, if I may admit, and I went to the guard post on the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Cuba, and I said, I want to talk to the leadership of your country. I do that everywhere I go, by the way. I go to the White House, I go to Paris, and I said, I'd like to speak to your leaders. And the Cubans said, welcome, and they brought me inside, and within 20 minutes I was sitting with two members of the Central Committee of Cuba who had a file on me as a social justice activist. All the evil things that I did in the United States were good things in Cuba, fighting against racism and poverty. Cuba is the only nation in the world that mobilized 100,000 people for the freedom of Mumia Abu Jamal in Hogun. And Cuba is the only nation in the world that has opposed every imperialist intervention from the time of its revolution, defeated the counter-revolution, including the American invasion, and has survived what in any other place would have been a 53-year war against it because it eliminated the whorehouse that the United States organized and supported under the Batista regime. So with that, I would like to introduce our next speaker, and I don't want to miss uh, this. His name is Alejandro Molina, and give me one second to give him a proper introduction. Well, let's pre-Oscar first. <laughs> 
Where is that? Okay. There's a special reason, not only because he is for the freedom and organizing for the freedom of Oscar uh, Motley, Lopez Rivera, and has spent a lifetime doing it, but because Oscar was a roommate with one of the Cuban Five for five years in an American prison, and we wanted Alejandro to read Oscar's message to his cellmate, and we wanted to dedicate ourselves like we did to the Cuban Five's freedom, to the freedom of Oscar Lopez Rivera. Alejandro Molina has organized in the Puerto Rican Latino communities in New York, Hartford, San Francisco, and Chicago around the issue of Q Puerto Rican political prisoners. The editor of USA on Trial, he sits on the coordinating committee of the Natural Boricua Human Rights Network and is playing a leading role in organizing the May 30th, a day for Oscar Lopez Rivera. Let's give a warm welcome to Alejandro Molina. Buenos dias y gracias. <coughs> Compañeros, it's an honor to be invited to read Oscar's message here. I'll try to be brief and I'll start. Letter from Oscar Lopez Rivera, May 8, 2015. For those of us who love justice and freedom, want a better and more just world free of colonialism and imperialism, revolutionary Cuba has been and will continue to be a beacon of hope and an example to emulate. It is admirable that Cuba has achieved so many accomplishments in spite of the many attacks the U.S. government has carried out against its government and what it represents, including an invasion, terrorism, the killing over 3,000 Cuban citizens, and a criminal economic embargo. Revolutionary Cuba has been able to set an example of the importance of the development of human resource, of solidarity, and of the need to defend just and noble causes. It started with a nation in shambles, with an economy in chaos, and responding primarily to the economic interests of the USA, a poor educational system, and a deficit in many important professions. But today, Cuba can send doctors and other medical professionals, engineers, teachers, and military personnel to help other countries all over the world. And its literacy program is being used in many parts of the world in order to eradicate illiteracy. It is the most literate country in all of the Caribbean and Latin America. Its praxis in solidarity is unique in the world. One act of solidarity that really reflects the generosity and commitment of Cuba and its government is what it did in Angola in order to stop the racist army of South Africa. As many as 50,000 Cuban soldiers participated in that military operation, and thanks to the Cubans, the South African army was defeated and the back of the apartheid regime broken. This was the reason why Nelson Mandela let the world know that the Cuban people and its government were the best friends he and his people had. And for us Puerto Ricans, Cuba has always been the other wing of the same bird and the greatest supporter in helping us defeat and eradicate colonialism. Cuba is the place where so many of us feel like we are home. At a personal level, I feel indebted to the Cuban government and to the Cuban people. As a Puerto Rican political prisoner, I have been the beneficiary of its generous and enormous support. I've had the honor and privilege to spend over four years in prison with Fernando Gonzalez, one of the Cuban five. Those four years have been the best and most meaningful time of the 33 I've spent in prison. Fernando was not only a compañero, but a brother. He incarnated the very best of what the Cuban Revolution has achieved. He earned the respect and admiration of many of the prisoners. They often approach me to ask how he is doing and want me to send their love and respect to him. Since Radio Havana, Cuba, just celebrated its 54th anniversary, I must mention how important the station has been to me. For many years before coming to prison and while in prison, I have been a listener of many of its programs. I want to congratulate the workers of Radio Havana Cuba for the great work it has done and continues doing. I want to thank Comandante Fidel Castro, 
President Raul Castro, the Cuban government and its people, for all it has done and for all it has given us. Let's keep on demanding that the embargo be lifted and that Guantanamo is returned to Cuba. Oscar Lopez Rivera. As you know, it's not an exaggeration to say that Mumia Abu Jamal is near death. And it's not an accident. They are trying to kill him. They gave him, they never discovered after 34 years in prison that he was a diabetic. And they gave him medication to solve an eczema problem that drove his blood sugar up to 781, 11 points. Low, 21 points lower than going into diabetic coma. He was in diabetic shock. He could barely walk. They had to take him to the prison infirmary. And when they treated him from eczema with a drug, it exacerbated the situation. And he was near death and could barely speak. And yet he got his messages out to us via prison radio again. It wasn't the first time they tried to kill Mumia. When he approached to defend his brother, Billy Cook, who was being clubbed by a police officer, he was shot in the chest. And he lay on the sidewalk unconscious. And the police picked him up and put him on a stretcher. This is in 1981. They dropped him off the stretcher. They put it on again. They rammed his head against a telephone pole. They threw him in a van and beat the shit out of him trying to kill him. And they had an officer, Alphonse Giordano, say in charge, he was in charge of the scene, that Mumia said, yeah, I'm glad I killed the motherfucker. Oh, Giordano never testified because he was indicted, convicted, and in prison for being, a, by the Justice Department and the FBI, for being one of dozens of Philadelphia police who regularly intimidated witnesses planted evidence, were involved in drugs and all kinds of other activities. And Mumia was their leading critic. And the cop mayor, uh, chief of police who became mayor said that they were gonna hold responsible, Mumia responsible for his attacks on the Philadelphia Police Department. So Giordano never got a chance. They took him to Jefferson Hospital, unconscious, and they beat him again in the hospital. They put their foot on his drainage bag and tried to force the fluids up into his body once again. And then he survived. And six months later, two officers who were on the scene said, oh, I forgot. He confessed that he killed police officer Faulkner, whereas the medical examiner who was on the scene all the time said, quote, in the report, the male Negro never spoke a word. They tried to execute him three times, but our movement stopped the execution. <laughs> if it wasn't for the mass mobilization, including 25,000 people in San Francisco and Philadelphia, Mumia would not, be, would not be alive today. We continue to struggle for his freedom and his very life, and now I'd like to introduce you to the single person who is the founder and leader and longtime fighter for Bumia's life and for all human rights, the founder of the International Concern, family and friends, the indef of Bumia Abu Jamal, the indefatigable fighter for the liberty of all political prisoners, let us welcome Pam Africa.
to mill out of mean, and a lot of political prisoners, Puerto Rican, Asian, and all, and people who are not political prisoners is under very terrible health conditions, and they want us to sit by and watch. Mumia is that one in millions that can bring attention to the millions that are in there that is suffering under medical neglect. When I visited Mumia last Saturday, um, and I, I don't know how many people really know, I'm gonna try to do this fast, when his wife Wadia went to see him the week before I did, she described Mumia as barely able to breathe, walking, baby steps to over where she was at. His thighs was huge. He was in constant pain. The, the um, skin problem had, you know, bust and blood was seeping out his arms. And, you know, when I went to visit him Saturday and uh, things were just about the same, his legs had went down a little bit. The conditions with his skin was the same but Mooney could walk a little better. He walked like someone who had chains around his ankles and, all, and was shuffling like this. And in terrible pain, when I saw Mooney, Mooney pulled himself together enough to try to make me feel comfortable. That's Mooney. But, under these conditions, we're asking people, for those who don't know, Mumia doctor on the outside now can call Mumia and talk with Mumia. He has not been able to see Mumia, touch Mumia. He talks through a lawyer to the Department of Corrections. And had he not been able to do that, we would not have known that one of the drugs that they gave Mumia that caused the swelling and all these things that they stopped a couple weeks ago, they gave him another medication. This medication, when I was on my way to the prison, the lawyer called me, Brett Brody called me to let me know that tell Mumia to call the doctor as soon as possible. Well, what it turned out that phone conversation was about was that they had given Mumia another medication and all its side effects were very harmful. At this particular point, Mumia is refusing to take this medication. They're trying to make him sign a release form stating that they're not responsible if anything happened to him because he won't take the medication. I say they need to sign a release form saying that they are the cause of everything that is happening to me. If release forms have got to be signed, you know, and the reason why the doctor can't see Mumia is behind the fact that they said that if the doctor came in to see Mumia and talk with the other doctors, they, they can file litigation against them at another time. I'm saying if you're not doing anything wrong, what is your problem with another doctor coming in? Because it's clear. And on some people call it medical neglect, I call it straight out attempted homicide on Mumia. When we couldn't get in contact with Mumia and the prison wasn't giving us information, people said, well, what are we going to do? This was when Wadia saw him and put out the alarm of what was going on. Prison wouldn't answer, governor office wouldn't answer. I said, call 911. There's a crime being committed here. But people was taking that lightly. I'm serious. And or you know, file a police report. A murder is happening while we sit back and look. I'm saying we're doing everything that we can within this movement to put pressure. But we gotta step it up a little bit more and all because while we're waiting for things to happen and to get in the court, we got to demand. And I'm saying we got to demand and be up front and all where we're visible and all to demand that Mumia's doctor be allowed to come in. First demand is release Mumia because Mumia is innocent. And we do have the information to do that. But in the meantime, I saw it. But in the meantime, 
let us all gather and go and do what is necessary. And uh, to, like this governor's event that they're having in San Francisco in June, where all, not the governors, the mayors is coming together. I think we need to be there, lifting our voices, not only for Mamiya, but for every, uh, for every other person. Um, on July 25th and on the um, March in Newark, we must be a part of that for all over against police brutality and every other social injustice that's happening. But please understand that this is now is the time and uh, we got these people picked. All the information is there to stop this murder. Let us not take baby steps as they have forced Mumia to do to move and uh, to get around. Let's take giant steps and leaps and do what is necessary. Let's come together with a plan and uh, to actually stop this murder of Mumia and other political prisoners. Mumia, I got one minute, in uh, 60 seconds. Within that 60 seconds, when Mumia go to get his medication, there's 100 other men of color and poor whites that are in a medication line and are for diabetic medicine. None of them is getting a diabetic diet. That is clear genocide. When you give people a medication that you gotta have a certain you know, diet for and you don't get it, and all you know, we gotta act fast now because Mumia is the only one that they're killing. And we got to put that word out. I'm doing a workshop at 4:15 um, in the diamond room, dealing with political prisoners. If you have time and all from you know other things, please stop up there and help you know help us build a front, a continued front for all political prisoners. With that, I say thank you on the move and let's rise up, everybody. Get ready to work. Three more minutes. Thank you, Pam Africa. Our next speaker is Mark Burton. He is a criminal defense and civil rights attorney from Denver who represents the FARC political prisoner, Simone Trinidad, who is imprisoned in Supermax in Colorado. Mark has been involved in Columbia Solidarity work for a number of years and has helped organize two delegations to Columbia and one to the Colombian peace process in Havana, Cuba. So Mark will tell us how the United States government went about kidnapping uh, a man in cahoots with the government of Colombia and now has him uh, in a supermax prison. Mark Burton. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, recently I had the honor to be asked to represent uh, Simon Trinidad, um, who's uh, imprisoned in my state. He's a political prisoner, a prisoner of war, a prisoner of the empire, and a member of the FARC EP, which is the FARC People's Army. Um, I would, um, <clears throat> and his native Colombia is also known as the Man of Steel. That's because of his keen intellect and his solid uh, beliefs in his cause. The thing I'd most like to be able to do, which I can't, is to read a letter or a greeting to this conference from him. But that's not allowed. He is in Florence Supermax in an 8 by 11 cell, uh, underground, cannot communicate with any, anyone except for a few people. He's under what's called a SAM, a special administrative measure. He can't talk to the press. He's asked to meet with the International Red Cross. Can't meet with any of them. Um, the, and uh, he's not allowed to. And just to, I have to sign the same to, to visit him and to meet with him. I'm not allowed to bring anything he tells me to uh, the public. And this is what we call democracy in the United States. Um, Simon Trinidad is from, actually from a, a, a quite, uh, his, I'm going to tell you a little bit about his origin. He's from a, a quite, uh, 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 wealthy family, not wealthy, but fairly well-to-do family. Um, but through his activities as a 
In the 1980s, uh, working with uh, people in rural areas, he became very concerned about uh, the uh, rural working class in, in Colombia, in his native uh, province of Cesar, in the, in the, north, uh, in the north of Colombia, in the uh, Atlantic coast region. Um, in the 1980s, pursuant to a, a uh, peace process, the, the FARC and, some other, and m many other broad front joined a, a found, founded a party called the uh, uh, Patriotic Union, and he decided to join that. He had been a, a member of the Liberal Party. And at that time, he became in, into contact with the FARC. And um, what happened was, that unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, the, the Patriotic Union uh, disputed elections, two elections, and uh, they got too much, too many votes that, was, uh, <laughs> that the, the Colombian and their U.S. masters uh, made, them, made them uncomfortable. And there was a wave of assassinations against uh, people in the Patriotic Union. And in fact, there's a, a, a court case of genocide in the American Court of Human Rights. Up to 4,000 other members were, um, were assassinated. Uh, Mr. Trinidad, instead of, uh, he had a choice. He sent his family to Mexico for safety because he was getting, starting to get uh, death threats. And he didn't take them seriously. And he was a professor of economics as well as a, a banker. He, um, a friend of his at the university uh, also got a death threat and was assassinated. So he decided it's time to act. I either have to leave the country or I have to join with the FARC. At the age of 37, he went to uh, visit the FARC leadership and asked to join. Uh, and even though at his advanced age for that kind of work, uh, he was uh, allowed to, uh, um, <laughs> he, he, was, he was allowed to join. The, uh, to join. And he, uh, yeah. He, he became known not as a, as a military man, but as a, as a thinker, as an economist, and as a peace negotiator. Um, he, uh, he was a key figure in, the, in a former peace talks in uh, San Vicente del Caguan. He, uh, he became a negotiator for the FARC and, and, and became very famous. And there's all sorts of statements from him and pictures of him there. Um, but his main interest was in, in peace. Uh, since his time as, as, a, as a younger man in, in peace. And in 2004, he went on a peace mission to meet with a UN official in the country of Ecuador, but the Colombian government, through their intelligence, uh, had been following him, and he was captured in Ecuador on January 2nd of 2004. He was then extradited to Colombia, um, and the Colombian government asked the United States government to extradite him to the United States. And they, they, their first response was no, because we, we don't have any crimes against him. Well, they cooked up some crimes. They did a, they, uh, they, they did a, uh, uh, they did a number on him. They charged him with narco trafficking, the usual things you hear about uh, Latin American revolutionaries. They're narco traffickers. Uh, all sorts of revolutionaries around the world. You know, they can't be just people who believe in fighting for justice, fighting for people. They're narco traffickers, and they also accused him of uh, hostage taking. Well, the, in 2003, February 13th of 2003, the, um, the, the, the FARC had shot down a plane that contained three American military contractors. And uh, they were there spying on FARC positions, sending uh, videos back to the Southern Command in Florida that were eventually used in aggressive operations against the Colombian people. Uh, Mr. Trinidad never, ever had any uh, personal knowledge, control, or anything over these people. But they charged him. They took him to Washington. They, um, they, um, and after four trials, took four trials. He was convicted of one crime of conspiracy, which, yeah, which all, all, um, all uh, lawyers know is the most broadest thing that you could ever imagine. Imagine. Um, so, uh, the Colombian government wanted to make an example of him. Okay, uh, to show that we can crush rebellion. Well, they couldn't, and um, he's become a symbol of resistance. He's become a symbol of peace. And uh, there are peace talks going on in Cuba right now. Um, and uh, to understand that, you have to get rid of one lie. But there are not peace talks going on because the, the popular movement in Colombia is weak. There are peace talks going on in Colombia because the popular movement is strong. And uh, they continue to fight. They're strong politically. They're strong militarily. And they can't be defeated. Um, the, um, the, he's been named one of their top five negotiators in, in the peace talks in, in Colombia. And there, there is a massive a campaign to get him out and everywhere. The, the Colombian government, I got it, 
the Colombian government in, uh, ha, ha, is agreeable to him being released. The FARC have said they won't sign a peace agreement out there. There, the only impediment is our government here. <laughs> so we have to call for Simon Trinidad to be released so that he can go and do this important work for peace. And uh, th there's the free Ricardo Palmera. He's also known as Ricardo Palmera. That's his birth name. Um, they're circulating a petition here, and they're going to be doing activities, so please sign up. And I, I call for the freedom of Simon uh, Trinidad. I call the, for the, the freedom of all political prisoners. And I ask you to support the Colombian peace process. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mark Burton. Um, our next speaker is El Haj Mori Salakan, a metropolitan Washington, D.C. based human rights advocate, author, lecturer, and poet. He is the founder of the Coalition Against Political Imprisonment, the National Association for Police Accountability, and the Peace Through Justice Foundation, a uh, Washington, D.C. based grassroots human rights organization. And Mr. Salakan is also the author of several books. Maury Salakan. Oh, there he is. He's coming. Bring it up a little prop because I want you all to see who I'm going to be talking about. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Back in the mid-90s, I think it was 1995, there was a hearing held in downtown Philadelphia for Mumia Abu-Jamal. I remember getting on a crowded elevator and the person standing next to me who at the time was Mumia's lead defense counsel was the late Leonard Wineglass. And he leaned over, I had never met him before. He leaned over to me in that crowded elevator and he said, congratulations on your victory on Terrence Johnson. I hope that we collectively can do the same for Mumia. That brief moment in that crowded elevator came to symbolize how I had inadvertently become the face of the campaign of a young man, a young African American who was brutalized by Prince George's County Police when he was 15 years old. And ultimately, out of that brutalization, ended up doing almost 17 years, he was 15. And we became involved in his campaign um, after the third time he was denied parole. And one of the African American weeklies did a petition drive on his behalf. That's how it came to our attention, myself, a brother by the name of Mark Thompson, who was uh, head of a uh, student organization on UDC's campus, a businessman by the name of Talib Ukda. The three of us formed this, this committee to work on his release. And after three and a half years of dogged work in the court of public opinion, he was released. I chaired the committee. I became very closely identified with Terrence Johnson. And then something happened about within two years of his release, he ended up killing himself under very troubling circumstances, shot himself, and that hurt me. It, it hurt me deeply, and I said, out of that tragedy that I would never allow myself to become close to any case, emotionally close to any case again, and I didn't, until Afia Siddiqui. 
Afia Siddiqui is a young Pakistani woman who came to the U.S. when she was 18 years old in 1990. She did her first year at the University of Houston, then she got a full scholarship to MIT. She went off to MIT, graduated with honors, went from there to Brandeis University, where she got a PhD in cognitive neuroscience. Brilliant young woman. Afia was also, or I should, I should say, is also a Hafiza of Quran, meaning she has memorized the Quran. And she was very deeply committed to her faith. She was known at MIT and Brandeis for her dawah efforts and also for her humanitarian relief work. And because of this positive activism, she became a person of suspicion after 9-11. And that suspicion followed her home when she left the United States, went back to Pakistan in 2012, by this time married two young children, a third one uh, uh, in, in her belly. And just months after she gets back home, in March of 2003, she is targeted for rendition. She and her three young children are kidnapped, disappeared, and for five years no one knew where she was. And then in 2008, after four Arab Muslims escaped from Bagram in Afghanistan, she was kidnapped from Karachi, Pakistan, her home city. Five years later, when four Arab men escaped from Bagram in Afghanistan and told stories about how they had been targeted for rendition, how they had been tortured, and they all told the story of this one woman whose name they didn't know, but they de described her as a young Pakistani woman who had lived for a number of years in America, had been torn from her children, didn't know where they were. She was like a ghost prisoner to them. They would just see her from time to time, but they would hear her haunting screams on a daily basis, usually at night, because of what was being done to her. And as word got around uh, far and wide, and people began to put pressure on the, uh, 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 the US authorities who were controlling Bagram, the Pakistani authorities, because this is an American citizen, and Afghan, because this is their territory, to admit, number one, a woman was being held there, and number two, identify that who she was. We believe she is Afia Siddiqui. They released her on the streets of Ghazni in Afghanistan and then set her up to be killed. The short of it is, Afia ended up being shot, but she didn't die. She ended up getting emergency treatment, then was hella back, back to the United States, where she has been ever since. 12 years of wrongful imprisonment, five years of secret imprisonment overseas, followed by now seven years of torturous imprisonment on a military base in Fort Worth, Texas, Carswell, FMC Carswell. And my brothers and sisters in struggle, I've often asked why Afia, Brother Salakhan, Mr. Salakhan, Maurice Salakhan, there are many cases, you've been involved in many. Why is it you feel so passionately about this woman? One minute. Why do you feel so passionately, as is evident, about this woman, this one prisoner? It is because, ladies and gentlemen, if I think Afia Siddiqui is a litmus test for us all, if the government can get away with doing this to a Muslim woman of Afia's caliber, none of us are safe. None of us are safe. And then the last point I want to make is because the health and welfare of this potentially great but deeply disturbed nation called America is also at stake. Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah who if he were alive today, he would be considered a militant, an extremist. He said something that was very true then and now, many, many, many generations ago. Civilization is based on justice and the consequences of oppression are devastating. Therefore, it is said, Allah, God, aids the just state even if it is non-Muslim, yet withholds his help from the oppressive state even if it is Muslim. I have one minute. You're getting an extra minute. I'm getting an extra minute. Thank you so much. Well, let me say this. With this extra minute, I'm going to remind us all, especially those of us who have never visited 
the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C., and walked up into this grand memorial and read some of the inscriptions on the wall. If you've never been there, there is one inscription that reads, and it, it mirrors what che che Gibbon Tamiya said many, many generations before Jefferson. And he didn't have the contradictions that Jefferson had. <laughs> Jefferson wrote, I believe, in the wee hours of the morning to one of his close friends in a letter, I tremble for my country. When I reflect, God is just. His justice cannot sleep forever. We are here, we have convened this conference for the purpose of organizing a deeper well of pushback on the major human rights issues of the day. I pray to Almighty God that we all leave here re-energized, and more deeply committed to bringing about that necessary change. Because if we don't, this nation is going to be as, as bad as some of us think it is now. Five or 10 years from now, if this country remains on the trajectory that it's on, it's gonna be many times worse. I love this country. I was born and raised here. It doesn't belong to the Bush family or the Clinton family or any of these others. This is part of God's earth. And I think it is my and our responsibility to do, to do as much as we can to defend our land and to force it, if necessary, to live up to the better part of itself. May God bless us before this conference has ended to renew that type of commitment. The last thing I want to say is this. Our sister, Afia Siddiqui, she needs our collective support. The, 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 what has been said about her, the, the official story of Afia Siddiqui is just as ridiculous as the official account of 9-11. And right now she needs our support. If she doesn't get it, and I think Lynn, my sister Lynn, she knows this. If she doesn't get that support soon, and she's not released soon, she's going <clears> to <throat> die soon on that military base in Texas. She needs an independent medical team to be allowed in to examine her, first to determine that she is still alive because she has been so cut off that her family has not even been able to visit her in almost a year. Thank you. Thank you. Sharman Siddiqui is here. There she is, okay, is our next speaker. And she's director of the Prisoners and Families Committee of the National Coalition to Protect Civil Freedom, where she supports and organized families of Muslim political prisoners targeted in the domestic war on terror. As a prison abolitionist activist, prisoners, prisoner rights advocate, organizer and artist. She incorporates visual art in her academic and organizing work. Sharman Siddiqui. Okay. I'm going to stand here. Zurat Adunka's voice cracked in tears as she recounted the invasion of her peaceful home by federal agents in 2007. She was washing dishes on a quiet evening when the door to her home in New Jersey exploded as if it had been bombed. Ten or more massive men in SWAT suits stormed in, pointing rifles and guns at her. Terrified, she lifted up a chair to protect herself from the intruders and screamed at the federal agents, Don't touch me! I'm Muslim, please let me put my headscarf on. But the agents threw her onto her kitchen floor, slammed her to the ground, and pushed her face down. They handcuffed her hands behind her back and forced her to stay in that position. Then they ransacked her home for over five hours, looking for guns and weapons. They found none. Zurata and her husband and their three little sons Dry Tang, 
Shane and LJ Duca was entrapped, along with their two friends, were entrapped by an FBI uh, informant in uh, South New Jersey. And uh, I start with this to basically uh, grab your attention to me. Um, the, uh, the investigation was led by Governor Chris Christie, who was then, the, uh, was, was then leading the U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, I, am really, I feel really humbled and privileged to be part of this panel. Um, the political prisoners uh, included in this panel is where I learned my work to do um, the work that I do with the National Coalition to Protect Civil Freedoms around the Muslim, post the Muslim political prisoner. So this was one of my speech, I'm gonna read my speech now. So I'm here as a sister of a political prisoner, my brother, Shiva Sadiqi. I'm also here as someone who works closely with families of post 9 11 Muslim political prisoners whose loved ones have been profiled, targeted, and trapped, incarcerated by the new liberal military prison, and I'm going to borrow from Ray McGovern, corporate security intelligence and add Islamophobia, white supremacist industrial complex of a declining empire in fear of losing its glory. And it wants to persist by instilling paranoia and using Muslims as the new scapegoat under the guise of protecting national security in the war of manipulating human emotions as the rhetoric war on terror, but it's actually the war of terrorism on all our communities. As we can see in the, in the context of Zarata. I want my brother. Uh, my brother was born and raised in the US. Um, he is fluent in Arabic, in actually in Quranic, the ancient uh, Arabic, and was translating political, religious literature, some, which some may find distasteful because they're political in nature, from Arabic to English, and publishing them in an online publication, a Tibian publication. So if you know of Tariq Mahana's case, he was also translating for the same publication. And he was connecting with youth, um, Tariq Mahana and my brother, they knew each other from this publication. Um, and, and, and they're basically, um, you know, exchanging these ideas and talking about the wars abroad. Uh, and their frustrations about um, what a Muslim need to be doing in this context. My brother um, was working with my sister, who's a political activist in Atlanta, Georgia, in a women's rights organization that focused on ending violence against women. He volunteered with organizations such as Women's Actions for New Directions, as uh, many of us know, is a national organization whose, whose mission is to empower women to act politically, reduce militarism and violence around the world. He spoke out against the U.S. violence in Iraq and Afghanistan, helped organize anti-war protests in Atlanta, Georgia with my sister and with the progressive community there. He was a community leader. He used to give private sermons um, in, in Atlanta and also in Bangladesh. Uh, so he was a community leader, preacher, and a teacher in the making. He was an ins inspirational speaker. If anybody comes across, um, talks to him, they always, you know, he's very motivational. So that was threatening to the U.S. government. He went to a Muslim school in Canada for a short while and then went to Bangladesh in 2005. He, he also lived in Bangladesh for a while, returned here, then went back uh, to get married. And 12 days after he was married, in April 2006, the U.S. government had him kidnapped off the street um, when he and his wife was returning home after a post-wedding shopping. And, he, and they made him disappear for a couple of days. He was blindfolded, punched, kicked, and they via renditioned him in a secret CIA aircraft. Um, so Shiva is one of the first young Muslim men to represent himself at his own trial in the federal court system. And we need to understand this act as a, as a political statement when prisoners do that. Um, he had four charges, but he was sentenced to 17 years. Um, uh, four charges that had 60 years, and he was sentenced to 17 years, and is currently located in communications management unit. In the context of the war on terror, the myth of national security that is used as justification to target Muslims and all of our communities um, has affected all our communities. And as families targeted, we already know the state has chosen our innocent loved ones as the scapegoat, and they bear the brunt of the of state's most egregious imperialistic counterterrorism measures. 
The state has targeted our community leaders, teachers, and preachers, or those who appear to possess those characteristics. Um, in other, uh, other contexts, the, the state has also targeted the most vulnerable uh, members of our community. Um, in, invest in members of our community. This targeting of Muslims at home, as we know, is connected to the broader expansion of the imperial carceral state and its new liberal capitalist political agendas abroad, trying to control Muslims and other communities of color to rule over the world. This impacts our collective safety and freedom. And when our collective safety and freedom is taken away and attacked, that's a form of violence in all our communities. Um, Despite these measures, uh, the, the families feel isolated and alienated within the larger American communities, society, and within their own Muslim community. However, we remain resilient in the face of this state violence. We will not stop fighting for our loved ones. They have committed no crime, certainly no act of violence. They're all political prisoners. We will continue to expose the rights violations in federal courts and prisons and the state violence that we have been made to endure. My presence here represents the resistance to this violence of the imperial state. So, as a, um, so we must unite, organize, and expose this inherent imperial violence in, our, in all our struggles and movements, and, and make sure that political prisoners should be included at, as the center and front of all our struggles, and demand the release of all our political prisoners. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is the oldest of my friends in this room. We graduated Jamaica High School together in 1958. And when Lynn Stewart comes up here, we're going to sing you the school song. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn is a brilliant attorney. No matter what the government says, when they took away her license to practice, she defended more political prisoners than you can ever imagine. And when the former Attorney General of the United States asked her to defend the blind sheik Omar Abdel Rahman, she took the assignment. And she had to fight for her very life. When I first met her in California, she got in the front seat of my car and this very handsome young man got in the back seat and she pointed to him and said, Jeff, I'd like to introduce you to Ralph Pointer, my husband. And I said, the Ralph Pointer? And Ralph said, what do you mean the Ralph Pointer? And I said, the Ralph Pointer who led the struggle of the black community against the racist Shanker school strike in 68? He said, that's me. And I was side by side with Lynn on standing up against a racist strike. Now Lynn has a stupid side. <clears throat> I want to tell you about it. She's sitting there as a defendant in her own behalf. And she says, why didn't you wait if you disagreed with the special administrative order? Why didn't you file a grievance? And there's a jury with her life in her hand. And Lynn says, well, I have this friend named Mumia Abu Jamal. With your life at stake, she talks to the jury about a friend of hers who is a convicted murderer, in quotes. And she said, and, and the government opened up his mail, and he had to file a suit for the right to have correspondence with his attorney secret, and he had to wait nine months, and I didn't want to wait nine months to defend the rights of my client. And then, when Mike Tiger, her attorney, asked her the last second on the witness stand, because Lynn passed out a press release for her client, Omar Abdel Rahman, and uh, Lynn, uh, and, and uh, Mike said to her, Lynn, if you had to do it all over again, would you do the same thing? Now, any smart person would say, oh, I made a mistake. I mean, I wasn't thinking what I was doing. But Lynn, and I was right there, with a tear rolled down her voice, she, down her face, she said, I, I would hope, I would think, I would think I had to, I would do it again. 
And for that, this goddamn government put her in jail for 10 years. First three, and then when she walked out into the street after the 27 month sentence, and the media, there were five, how many of you were there when she walked out the first time? And the media, as a reporter said, um, how do you feel about 27 months? And Lynn, who had her toothpaste in a plastic bag ready to go to jail for 10 years said, I think I can do 27 months standing on her head. And the government said, that's not what they, what do they call it? You didn't show enough contriteness. The government, the federal government intervened, demanded that the judge resentence her, put the screws on him, and she gave her 10 years, which was a death sentence. And she's here today for two reasons. She wouldn't give up, and we didn't give up, and that's why we have a free Lynn Stewart. to me for many years, almost five, home, to go home, to be home. And I know it is for my brothers and sisters who remain behind bars. All they want is to be home. So what to do? The fact that there are so many political prisoners <clears throat> expresses or betrays the weakness and the ineffectiveness of our movement. Except, and I am one of the exceptions, there are others. I am home. And I am home as my dear friend and the West Coast coordinator has said, I am home because of the support and the insistence that I come home of all of you and countless others who may not be on our same page of revolutionary necessity, but who understood that this was wrongful, this was overborn, and it must be rolled back. So thousands of people signed petitions, hundreds of people came out to rallies and court events. My dear Ralph, that handsome young man, <laughs> stood in front of the White House in a hundred degree heat, mostly by himself, but with various groups coming to join him on certain occasions and said, let her go, let her go home. And home I came, and I am home today. And I received a letter, actually Ralph received this letter because I don't communicate with political prisoners because that's part of my probation. Uh, so Ralph writes all the letters, and Ralph got a letter from Matulu Shakur. who only happens to be an acupuncturist who figured out a way to deal with heroin addiction, but of course they put him in jail, and um, also was a member of the Black Liberation Army, I think I'm free to say that. Anyway, Ralph got a letter from Matulu, and the letter said, the men who wait behind bars 
are waiting for us to free them. We are their only hope, and their faith is greater than any religion. Their faith in our movement. We cannot betray that faith. Pam has talked to you about Mumia and his desperate situation, which we are trying to get past a point of no return. We are, I am going to spend the rest of my time, and I tell you, I am feeling fairly fit. My doctors say I am at a point where my cancer is not advancing. It's not retreating, but it's not advancing. Right. Oh. Right. And I hope using my own daughter, our own daughter, as a foundation, Dr. Zenobia Brown, to put together a medical cadre that we could have on call because our political prisoners are aging. They are in desperate shape, as, as talked to about Dr. Siddiqui and her, what situation she is in. And I feel that if we have a medical cadre that's willing to step in, even if it's just to read medical records, which the government and the jails must give up, that will be a step in the right direction. So, If you know a decent doctor, and that may be a, uh, what do they call that, a contradiction, uh, but if you know a decent doctor who might be willing to do some work for pro bono, for the good, please be in touch with me. We also need lawyers, because we have good lawyers, but not enough of them. I called a good lawyer the other day about one of the political prisoners, and she told me a number of things she thought about the case, and then said, but of course I'll need a $50,000 retainer. I said to myself, I too was a lawyer, but there wasn't a political prisoner who could call me that I had to have a retainer for. I did the work. <laughs> for the good, for the good, for the good of all. So we need lawyers, if you know young lawyers that want to cut their tooth on movement activities and they write to me still and say, what do you do to be a movement lawyer? And I say, join the movement and defend it. And I'm going to talk about the no-no, the big pink elephant that sits in the room whenever we talk about political, ele uh, political elephants, political prisoners, and that is their targets were often blue, cops. And people always say, oh, but he killed a cop, who me? But he killed a cop, boo, oh, he's convicted. That was then, this is now. When they acted, they acted out of the defense of their community, which was under attack. If you were alive in the 60s, you know what was happening in the black community. You know of the riots and the fires and the deaths, the deaths of people like uh, Clifford Glover in Jamaica, New York, a 10-year-old killed by a cop. But because the Panthers were out there and then BLA, you know, it was remarkably quiet during those years. There were not those killings. There was another force to be contended with. So whether you believe, as I do, that the best defense is an offense, you must believe that these men have served more than enough time, and that if we are to ever defeat the police state, we should start with freeing political prisoners and get rid of the myth that somehow a cop's life is worth more than anybody else's. My young friend is not holding up any signs so I definitely want to mention, any of you are in or around New York or want to come to be in and around New York on May 30th, Memorial Day weekend, oh, it isn't the weekend, it's the week after, 
I got an extra minute from Mackler. He, he has to do that. Uh, if you're in or around New York, that's when the great march will be for Oscar, Oscar Lopez Rivera. The remaining political prisoner from Puerto Rico. And they are all home, and we want to bring Oscar home. And closer at hand, for all you residents of Secaucus, no, uh, closer at hand, though, on the 13th of May in Philadelphia is the commemoration of one of the most infamous acts, and there are plenty of them, the bombing of the Move family, of which Pam Africa is a member, and of which there are still nine, is it Pam, or eight? Eight Move members still in jail? Seven, seven, one passed recently, once again, we don't have the doctors that can tell us what to do in those situations yet, yet. Probably, medical neglect is the name of the game, and I want to say to you, I know that too. But at any rate, there is going to be a big commemoration of that date, because it is a date we should remember. I know I can, you know, people say, where were you when Kennedy was killed? Where were you in 9-11? But I can also remember, where was I on May 13th, 19, let's see, what is it, 30 years, 85, when the word came out about the dropping of the bomb on innocent black civilians. So if you can get to Philadelphia, by any means possible, please be there commemorate, show that this is a date we all recognize and understand to be important. So I said earlier that we have had successes. I'm here. I would say the fact that Russell Maroon Schultz is no longer in solitary confinement after, what, 25 years is a victory. I would say that There are other victories out there to be won. And we can do them, we can do, we can have little victories for people, but we can have big victories too. And I think the only thing it takes is solidarity, resistance, understanding that it cannot be neglected. This is not something to put on your back burner. These people are aging, they are sometimes Matula also wrote that he, they, they wanted to amputate his leg. And he said, no, I'm, you can't do that. And then they found out what was really wrong with him and that amputation was not on the, on the table, so as to speak. So I just want to say, we must have more than rhetoric. We must have action. If you are called upon whether, wherever you live, please answer, answer that call on behalf of people who are in jail because they believed, as many of us do, in the freedom and equality of all people. Thank you. Don't step back. Whoa! Are you there? Lynn mentioned that there were some very important uh, actions that we should be at, and there are many more. Um, I wanted to let you know about a um, set, the last session tomorrow will be an opportunity to review the action proposal that is coming forth from UNAC to the conference, and we hope with your approval that will set the tone about what we stand for, what our motivations and goals are, and to talk about the future actions, because we, we believe that you don't just come to a conference and just listen and learn things, which is wonderful, but you go and take action when you leave. And so that's the opportunity for everybody at, I think it's 1.30 tomorrow, and um, there'll be an opportunity to discuss the uh, proposal, and I wanted to tell you that there are copies now out on the UNAC table in the, uh, in the corridor, 
and there'll be opportunities to discuss and approve or amend that resolution, and then we'll be entertaining the uh, action plans, and if some of your actions, important actions are left off, please bring them forward and we can, uh, ex you know, we can uh, endorse all of the things that are important that are coming up and give us things that we can do concretely together. Thank you. I just want to say one more thing. The most important uh, thing on our, our proposal is for actions in October, um, a week of actions, nationally coordinated actions in October that would um, deal with the, all the kinds of issues that we've been talking about today, that it be a unified collective outpouring, and it just happens also to coincide with the anniversary of when we initiated this war on terror um, on Afghanistan, and it's still going on, and many, many more. So hope you can stay and be here tomorrow. Thank you. Don't fall off. <laughs> the Grannies for Peace, Granny Peace Brigade is going to sing a song. Um, there will be a few members of, of them. If you guys would like to come up now, we'll set you up. One of them here is um, Lillian Pollock, who you should know last month celebrated her 100th anniversary, her 100th year on this planet. As was mentioned during our first session, some of the um, anti-war and social justice groups from this area, Jersey City and Newark, um, have put together a letter that's going to their senators. You um, may have heard Susan Metz urge them to include the Trans-Pacific Partnership in this letter, and they have done that on her urging. Um, and so people will be passing this letter around if you'd like to sign it to go to the New Jersey um, uh, senators, uh, please do so, and um, I'll let them know that we were here. That's right. So she's suggesting that in the letter you write in women and children um, so that uh, people are, are clear that that's what is happening. Now, are the grannies, someone needs to plug in a guitar here? Can you just put it in port two there and then turn it like halfway up? Um, after this, we're going to be just let in a couple of chants while we're switching over to another panel. I know two panels in a row are difficult, but we have some very important people to be heard from. Way, this way. Yeah. That's better. Excuse me, we usually do this as a group and give out song sheets, but we're not really that very prepared today, so you'll have to bear with us. They had to bring in even a ringer, a granny, who's hanging out with them because she also went to jail. <laughs> I must tell you that Lynn has been an honorary raging granny for the last eight years. <laughs>
you could sing it. It's a different. Uh, one more. Okay. Only one more? If I can sing it for what? Why can't I sing it? It's a different tune. Seems to be okay. I know that too. Oh, I'm yeah, an old girl. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, well, you know, that's an old girl. That's all the old girl. Same old girl. That's an oldie. It's an oldie. An oldie, an oldie we, but I got to do that. What should we do then? Okay. It seems. Well, we're waiting for her. We're going to try it. Is she going to do Angus Awards? Let's try it. All right. All right, we'll try it. We'll try it. All right, and don't hit me on the head. One, two, say. It seems to me I heard that song before. Well, come on to one another war. They say it's time to love me around. They invaded Iran.
need an introduction. <laughs> she ain't afraid, it. though. I think they got it. <laughs> so. You better be afraid, but you ain't afraid. Well, I'm not afraid. Jeez. And they aren't either. <laughs> no, she wasn't afraid. <laughs> Thanks to Grannies, as always. As the next panel is coming up, uh, and, the, and the chairs, we're going to have a couple of chance. Um, get our blood rolling a little bit. Um, we're going to be led by uh, Melanie, who's a, a member and of uh, a member and dancer of Kinding Sindal, learning, asserting, reclaiming, preserving, and recreating the ancestral Milhau heritage of the Philippines through dance, music, and martial arts. She is also a poet and she sees herself as a cultural worker for the people. She is now the Northeast Regional Coordinator of the National Alliance for Philippine Concerns. And Melanie, are you here? And are the other um, chairs for this session here? And the other people are gonna be speaking. They can, can um, come into a place where they can, uh, can come up easily. Puerto Rico. Uh, it's, it's interesting because I was thinking of being the last. Uh, usually, usually Puerto Rico is like delegated to the last. It's okay. Uh, but, you know, we are in an anti-war conference. And Puerto Rico is, is such a topic that encompasses everything. If it's an anti-war issue, of course, an anti-imperialist issue, it's an immigration issue, it's a racism issue, it's a labor issue, it's, a, it's such an important issue that, um, that I wanted precisely to talk about Puerto Rico, not only because I am from Puerto Rico. Um, and I wanted to touch on four things, which I'm going to raise the points and just like uh, points. I'm not going to explain things and, and we can uh, then get discussed. But there are four things within Puerto Rico that I wanted to raise. The acute economic crisis, the fight back in Puerto Rico, political prisoners in Puerto Rico, <coughs> which are uh, two, Oscar Lopez and Ana Belén Montes. So, economic crisis. Why I think that Puerto Rico, for those of us who consider ourselves socialists or anti-imperialist or anti-capitalism, Puerto Rico is such a perfect example of a perfect storm of capitalism. This is a colony within capitalism at its it end. And it is a, an example of how the system just does not work. And, and I think it's, it's also an example, uh, and I came up with this, it's like how capital uh, saves capital, like how Washington works with the corporation to save them, and this is a perfect uh, on Puerto Rico. Uh, of course, everybody knows Puerto Rico is a colony, it's an it's a acute crisis that I can go on more in, in the discussion, but to say it, it's like more than 73 billion is the, is the debt in Puerto Rico. And it's paid to, it's through municipal bonds. That's the loans that help Puerto Rico survive. It's through municipal bonds, which are tax free, and which are a lot of benefits, and they are rated now as junk bonds, but that makes it even more <coughs> appealing to some because it has a higher yield. Mm -hmm. But that they are wanting, they want the people, the working people, to pay by cutting jobs, by cutting schools, by closing uh, health care, by really oppressing the working class. And as a result, uh, around 3,000 people, on the average, leave Puerto Rico to the United States. And at the same, uh, and this is, the, we have lost almost a million people in the last few years due to this. And these are youth that have a high education, their skills. So, the, and, and from mostly public university, University of Puerto Rico. And so the Puerto Rican people are paying for the education of people who will come and benefit the United States economy. So that's, that's one thing. Um, the, uh, so what we did is we took an initial uh, group of defendants um, from the Department of Justice's list of terrorist, terrorists, I want to put that in air quotes, yeah. terrorist cases. Um, 
Today we have nearly 900 defendants on the list. There are a few groups who also track terrorism cases, um, such as Trevor Aronson wrote a piece for Mother Jones, and he looked at these, quote, terror cases. Uh, and there are a couple other groups that track these, but none of the groups seem to agree because no one seems to be able to agree on who a terrorist is. Um, so in order to analyze our database, what we did is we took the Department of Justice list of 399 cases and we analyzed them to see um, for what we call uh, preemptive prosecution. Now preemptive prosecution is a term that we use to say uh, people who are prosecuted without a crime having been committed first. Um, and this is what's going on. So our definition of preemptive prosecution, this study, um, looks at um, entrapment. So what we did, and actually Kathy, who's an attorney, did uh, most of the actual analysis of the cases. But she looked at um, was the case a case of entrapment where someone, the FBI, created the case and then solved their own case. Mm -hmm. um, and this has happened a lot. I don't know if people are familiar with uh, the Newberg Sting, the Newberg Four case, or Welcome, come on in, or um, uh, uh, the Fort Dix Five case, which happened in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and of course we could list many of them. So that's one of them, where the government sends in an informant and does an entrapment. Uh, the other types of cases are cases where the government um, arrests people on material support for terrorism, material support for terrorism, which could be uh, such as raising charitable funds, like the Holy Land Five, in Texas, they were the largest Islamic charity in the United States um, before the Iraq War, and they raised money for schools and hospitals in um, Palestine, and the men wound up, some of them got 65 years in prison for raising money for charitable gifts in Palestine. And the other issue of preemptive prosecution is people who may have done like small, like small technical crimes, like they didn't fill out their immigration form right, or they didn't, um, welcome, come on in. Um, or they didn't, um, uh, you know, they're like, it, or, or something that happened a long time ago, like in the case of Khalifa al Akili, who's the subject of a new movie. Um, he had um, held a gun at a gun range, but because he had a prior felony, he got eight years in prison for that. So those are the kinds of, of cases. So we analyzed all those cases because, you know, the government says, there's all these terrorists, there's Islamic terrorists around, right? And they're, and, and they're always capturing them. But when you really actually analyze the cases, what we discovered is that of these 399 Department of Justice cases, our report shows that 72.4% of the convictions were cases of preemptive prosecution using the entrapment, material support for terrorism, or conviction on a minor crime. Another 21.8% were people who um, you know, began to engage in minor non-terrorist type criminal activity, but whose cases were manipulated and inflated by the government to make it appear as though they were terrorists. These cases are referred to in the study as elements of preemptive prosecution. So overall, 94% of all the terrorism-related convictions on the Department of Justice list of terrorists are either preemptive prosecution or involve elements of preemptive prosecution. So these, and these are crimes that don't, you know, these crimes that we're talking about are crimes that no one was injured, no injuries happened, no property was damaged, nothing happened, and yet people are serving sometimes life in prison for <coughs> these kinds of prosecutions questions in regards to uh, the meaning of the BDS movement and the meaning of the liberation of Palestine. I, I will mention that um, there have been actually some exciting sort of developments um, globally. Um, um, actually the day that I left India on, on my last trip, I had a meeting with the general secretary of one of the larger independent left federations. Um, and they, that federation, along with six other uh, left um, federations, the different sort of left parties that are within the large Indian subcontinent, have recently formed a new alliance of trade, trade federations. And at their founding meeting, their founding conference, they launched 
for the first time an official Indian Trade Union BDS campaign. Um, um, but they were having some issues over the question of sanctions. Um, whereas we've been able to sort of build some a lot of success over the idea of boycott and divestment, the issue of sanctions, which in a lot of ways is not even not just as important but more important um, in, in um, when it comes to the dealings of countries like India, or Latin American countries, European countries when it comes to to Israel. Um, that was sort of uh, the point of contention among these sort of left trade federations. Um, and it sort of got me thinking, um, well, and so the trade federations reach out to me as the leftist trade unionist from the United States with Palestinian roots, asking, well, can you help us sort of make an argument in support of uh, sanctions that we can bring to the table of these left trade federations? And I had to really go back and think about it. Like, what are we saying among the BDS movement? We're gaining so much success on a divestment. Where, when are, where are we pushing countries to completely cut off their diplomatic relations with Israel? Where has that been successful? Um, in Latin America, it has. Um, to, and, but uh, even with the success of divestment coming from certain countries, it's, 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 it's much harder to sort of push for that, um, that next step of cutting off of diplomatic relations and cutting off of, of um, um, arms deals between countries and trainings, etc. cetera. Um, I also wanted to mention that I, uh, I was in Egypt about two weeks ago, perhaps, and um, I was actually just stopping by um, during a work trip, and um, I was very ha sort of happy to find myself there um, on the day that they were launching the first ever BDS campaign. Um, in Egypt. And this is very significant because BDS has always been, or B, I mean, BDS is BDS, okay? I just put the reminder out there. BDS is a tactic. It's a tactic in the movement to liberate Palestine. Um, so Palestine has always been a uniting force among the Egyptian progressive movement. Whether we're talking about left socialists that are anti cc or we're talking about Nasserists, so-called leftists that are pro-CC today, or we're, or we're talking about those who have been affiliated with the Brotherhood or with similar types of organizations. They were all present at the meeting to talk about launching a BDS, a new BDS movement in Egypt, the first BDS movement in Egypt. So in a lot of ways, it's, it's, it's reuniting forces that are coming back into the table and sort of thinking about specifically Egypt's relation to Israel and specifically how Egypt is becoming, uh, is becoming even more complicit um, in the siege of Gaza and in the occupation of Palestine. And it brings the movement in Egypt back to the early days of the anti-imperialist struggle of 2000, 2000, 2001, which alongside the workers' movement was key in opening up the public spaces that made the movement in 2011, in 2011 possible. Um, and so it's sort of, in a way, going back to the drawing board. But <clears throat> when you think about the BDS movement in Egypt, and think also about BDS efforts that have also um, arisen recently in Jordan, um, where groups of people have been organizing to stop uh, gas deals between the Kingdom of Jordan and, um, and Israel. Those are very significant, not just because you know, they're sort of a strong and important front in the fight for the liberation of Palestine, but it's it's a strong and important front for the liberation of Egypt and the liberation of Jordan and the liberation of the entire region. Uh, people who say, um, I don't like the language of, uh, what was it, um, death to capitalism. You know, I'm a person that comes from a more spiritual, I'm not saying, uh, I'm just saying my friends would say I come from a more spiritual place. I'm not uh, comfortable with that language. I'm not comfortable with freedom fighters. I'm not comfortable with armed resistance. Um, that is a, a, a very big division, even with a small group within uh, people who would call themselves part of either an anti-war or a peace movement. Uh, and I think those things are one of the obstacles that we have to making feel, people feel comfortable uh, in building the 
the structures of a movement. We have, uh, I think, UNAC that has a very left position, uh, and we have other groupings like Win Without War that are more mo mainstream groups uh, like Credo and uh, WAND, the women's groups. Um, they would not feel comfortable here, and many people here would not feel comfortable with them. I think one of the biggest barriers to any social justice movement is usually economics, whether it's here or overseas. 100%. For example, if you've got a mayoral candidate running on the rent is too damn high party ticket and he's saying the rent is too damn high, ain't nothing else to talk about. What is he saying? That nothing else is important because it's an economic issue that affects everybody, right? Overseas, if you are so poor that you can't feed yourself, and a terrorist group comes along and says to your village, we're going to give you guns and butter. What are you going to do? You're going to take the guns and butter. It's Germany in the 30s. If you ain't got the guns and butter, you're going to take it from whoever's providing it. And that is the barricade to just and humane societies <coughs> is economics. Well, and let me add to that that um, the problem that so many people in this country don't see how the military is robbing us of uh, so much of our own tax dollars um, because these wars are hidden from them and the military industrial complex is hidden from them is a, a barrier relating to what you're saying. In La Española, Santo Domingo. That was uh, called La Española. And, um, in Santo Domingo. In um, Dominican Republic. Diego de Colón, que fue el hermano de Colón, Diego de Colón, who was um, uh, Christopher Columbus's um, brother. Brother. Eh, él le puso el nombre de Santo Domingo porque su papá se llamaba Domingo y lo combinó con los santos que ellos trajeron. So um, he's talking about the name of um, Dominican Republic. Santo Domingo. He named. Um, no Dominican Republic. Oh, Santo, Santo Domingo. Domingo capital. That's the capital. So he named um, uh, the second part Domingo uh, for his um, father's name. Colom Colombo father. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and Diego Domingo. Colombo, um, two brother, the father name is Domingo. And Santo, which means uh, saint, has to do with the religion mm -hmm. they brought to America. And, and this is why. These two names. Por eso le pusieron el nombre a la capital, Santo Domingo. So that is why they named um, Santo Domingo as the capital. Pero quiero puntualizar un poquito en ese nombre. So, but I want to emphasize on this name. O sea, hasta en eso, los, esos inmigrantes eh, esclavistas, so, um, hasta en even, eso, even on, on that, hasta en eso ellos um, quisieron marcar They wanted to mark un punto claro en la historia. A clear point in history. ¿No? Eh, Poner el, 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 no, el, el, el nombre del papá. To name uh, the city after uh, their, their names a, or their red A una capital. To the capital of the city. And uh, what I see, what disturbs me a lot when I see what's going on in Ukraine, where um, those who have a dissent opinion are silenced by, by arrests, by what uh, Irina was talking uh, in her speech, and it's very, uh, it's, it's very disturbing, and I, I, never, I could never imagine that these things are possible uh, in Ukraine. So I started writing, and then uh, we, I was in, well, I applied and, and I was uh, invited to join a media press tour, media tour, I would rather say, organized by an NGO, or by a Russian NGO, for uh, um, Western journalists writing on, on the civil war, on civil conflict in, uh, in Ukraine. So we went for a week, basically we spent uh, three days in, in Donetsk. They took us to, um, you know, re um, residences to re residential areas destroyed by Ukrainian shells and, and bombs, and we talked to local residents. Uh, then we also visited, and they um, we talked to people who are involved now in this 
building of, of a new uh, state. They are working on it now, it's, which is called Donetsk, Donetsk People's Republic, and there is also Lugansk People's Republic. And, and we, uh, what we witnessed, we saw brave people who are trying, you know, to build an alternative to the oligarchic uh, regime in Kiev. And they, uh, the, the paradoxical situation is that these people in Donetsk are trying to, uh, to build what uh, the European Maidan was in Kiev. Because Ukrainians in, in Kiev, they were uh, claiming that they stand there for um, uh, European values of democracy, of human rights, for freedom of speech, for a government which is free of, uh, like I said, of corruption. That, uh, it, it's a plague that has been uh, there since uh, Ukraine became independent in 91. And still, after all this blood that was shed uh, <coughs> in, in, uh, in Kyiv, it's very, to me, it's very troublesome because it's very, it's very far from uh, those values that the um, participants of, um, uh, of the revolution of dignity in Kyiv were claiming. We have a regime that uh, tries to rewrite the Ukrainian history that goes against uh, half of that tries basically to kill another Ukraine. In a, by, by what, what I mean by another Ukraine is a Russian-speaking Ukraine who uh, has um, values that are closer to uh, traditional Russian values and who are not necessarily anti-European. They just don't want to 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 be uh, to join the European Union. They just want to live according to to the, the values that their fathers and grandfathers uh, instilled in them. So what I've seen in Donetsk, I was, it was a very distressful, um, uh, very, very difficult trip for me because I was the only Ukrainian there. And you know, when I saw we uh, stopped at a school um, in, in, in Donetsk area, and it, that school was empty, you could see the um, uh, traces of shells in, in, in the walls, and uh, I, my <coughs> colleagues were walking on, on the sports, um, I guess, uh, what do you call it? This where you play sport. Gym. No, it's not a gym. It was an open air. Well, arena. Yeah, arena. Yes, and they were picking up. I did not bring, but I I, I brought myself a piece of very heavy um, metallic, sh you know, sh uh, shell. Yeah, and there the, the whole courtyard was covered with them. And I stood there and I was and I said to myself, you know, I'm I'm uh, I'm what I'm. Witnessing now, it's it's a graveyard of Ukrainians and knew it, a country I, I grew up in. You know, it, it was very, it was a very difficult trip. But also, there, there, I, I saw this hope in in people who are, you know, trying to, they defy uh, the, the Ukrainian government, uh, complete um, cut off, because the, what Ukraine did, Kiev did, they cut off the the paying of social of pensions of uh, social benefits for people since last uh, summer. So they basically uh, built a blockade they, uh, around uh, Donetsk region, and and still those people they organized themselves. They are now they opened the first uh, Republican bank, what they call the own financial system, because the whole system crashed when. Um, the, the war started. Uh, they also have universities. Uh, the universities are functioning. Kids go to school, and and you can see uh, the the beginnings of of, of this new, um, I would say, state based on uh, no socialist ideas, based on uh, social uh, justice. So, it's the, the, these are my impressions that I I got from that uh, tour. So I guess I'll stop here, and if you get have questions, I will answer them. In being able to sell these people now into the southern markets and expand uh, the economy of the United States, you know, many, many fold uh, by uh, expanding the trade into the deep south and um, putting laborers in that, uh, in the deep south plantations. And if, if you think about that uh, in relation to, again, the Caribbean and New Orleans and, uh, and where we are, and if you think of a country that's only this big at this point and then suddenly becomes two thirds of what we know today, it's vast and it's all a part of the manifest destiny trajectory. Railroads are coming and it's only a hot minute before. In fact, it's during that period that Lewis and Clark actually make it to the Pacific Coast. So they know the bounds of the territories that they are after. And they are working on Mexico at the same time.
<laughs> so one of the things that, um, that I'll, that's sort of the, the segue to sort of talk about. So Shaco Bottom is 13 acres of, of land that has always been the trading center of, the, of Richmond, right? Because of the confluence of the Shaco Bottom meeting the James River, the James River meeting the fall line, all the deep water travel pretty much stops at Richmond. So that becomes the point at which everybody meets in order to do business. So that's how Shaco Bottom evolves. That's why the city of Richmond was founded there. Um, what then happens um, is that that trade continues to develop transportation, all the trades. One of the biggest ones, in, as you get towards uh, closer to the Civil War, is the flour industry and the iron works. And Richmond becomes, um, we think of southern cities and southern slavery as being tied primarily to plantation slavery, but industrial slavery in cities uh, is, is a huge part of uh, the moving of that, uh, of that money as well. And so um, Richmond is evolving as a, as a major uh, southern industrial city at this time as well. So the, the, the mechanics of having a slave society where it has its primary labor force essentially free is not really the right term exactly, unpaid, yes. Uh, but the economy that's built around having uh, that kind of a labor force is able to fuel this massive capital development uh, you know, in the city of Richmond. Uh, so the district itself has gone through ebbs and flows of that. Certainly as shipping dies away and, and trains become more important to transportation, um, then uh, you're looking at uh, different focuses on different industries um, as, you, as you move forward. By the time we get to the turn of the 20th century, um, it's, it's primarily railroad. And I'll share with you one experience I had I've been arrested eight times in, uh, as a protester. And one of the times, um, it was on May Day, and there was a female cop who was told to look through my bag that they had already searched. And she had something in her hand and she kept looking like she was gonna drop something in my bag. And on another occasion, I had been, uh, was going through the checkpoint at the Capitol of New York State, the Capitol building. And the same female cop and her uh, co-worker or accomplice, if I could use that term, uh, tried it again. And they put something in my bag as they're checking everyone. And then they said, she has to wait. And um, I had witnesses to this. And they're like, we see something. We see something. And so we, you don't see anything on me because I'm you know, my age and there's nothing I do. <laughs> okay. And they kept x-raying the bag and re-x-raying the bag. And then a little baggie fell out on the floor. And the girl kicked it and said, oh, well, you can go. And they let me go. I never forgot that. I worked at, in education. So I'm just finishing up. I worked okay. in education. And that could destroy me. And that's, that's all I wanted to say. That's a situation where they could ruin my life with a false arrest. Well, I, I guess, you know, personally, I would say I think we have to understand that that's part of the price to pay for, you know, doing the work we do. And um, I, for myself, have made a personal decision not to in any way temper uh, my commentary or, or my means of com communication because of what the government may or may not do. I think that that's, this is where we are. And if we get into that situation, of uh, acting on our fears to, to sh shut our mouths, then we're pretty much done for. But right. anyway, uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, I have a, a question for General. You mentioned the difficulty of getting people in the streets, and I'm wondering um, what uh, what successes. I mean, what what do you say? Is there something in particular you say that that has worked to get people in the street? Um, I think. People come out in the street when, A, they feel something is completely intolerable, and when they see that there's a chance of stopping it. And um, it, I don't have any explanation for you for Ferguson, but I do know that I, I was on Twitter the day that, that Michael Brown was left laying, his body was left laying for four and a half hours and I did pick up on Twitter that image and I don't know, I just felt when I saw that 
this is going to be big, something's going to happen. But it was the people from Ferguson that came out on the street then. Nobody came in from outside. All of us outsiders were not there. They stood up, and the whole world saw it, largely because of social media. The same thing with Freddie. My understanding is that um, people were very much consciously looking to Ferguson and what had happened in New York around Eric Garner and had, all of that is welling up and it's just too much. Um, I think just if I could just for a moment bring up the book that I, I meant to mention and I loved Anand Gopal's book, Every, um, No Good Men Among the Living. But this is um, Edward Baptist, Baptiste, who just came out with this book last year, The Half That is, Has Never Been Told. And I think it's the best of the new crop of books on slavery that I have read. And the reason I'm bringing this up is when we are out on the streets right now, and I, it is very good all these kids are coming out. Um, but I'm finding even myself, who, and I've tried to study this, being really astonished at what's in this book in particular. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is how slavery, the US system of chattel slavery, <coughs> built the US into a superpower. This is not Oh, slavery, yeah, that was so 19th century. This is how this whole system applied within the US and these colonies made an unchallengeable superpower, partially through accident, but through exploitation in a very systematic way. It didn't happen in Brazil, and there's, there were a lot more African people enslaved in Brazil. It happened here for some particular reasons. And there's no person living in this country that right now doesn't have to grapple with what it means that there's still a system of enslavement. There's a system in place where black people, brown people, you know, do not have the rights accorded to a white person. It's just not true that, that there's no great disparity. And so are we, you know, I, I write to tens of thousands of people every week in the World Can't Wait email list, and I hope some of you are on that list, but I get answers often to people, to people writing back about the war, but I don't get answers back mm -hmm. from the base of supporters much about what happened in Ferguson, what's happening in Baltimore, and I'm really struggling with why. Even say that I'm, I represent black people. Mm -hmm. okay. There is a multiplicity of uh, viewpoint and positions. I wasn't asking you to do I that. I understand. <laughs> I understand. No problem. I also want to thank you. Um, thank the, the, the conference and, and the and, and, from, and the panel for raising these questions. Uh, and I want to try to just run through these few points Please. very quickly in order to leave time for other people. I appreciate that. Um, uh, and that I got called on right now, as you have raised what has been very clear to many people who are activists and have studied the history of the United States. It is that the United States is in the position, in the position of wealth, not only the United States, but the West, mm -hmm. in, in its position of wealth because of, in direct relationship to and because the effect of the existence of chattel slavery in this country. Right. Having said that, that there needs to be a change. I, I agree with many of the, in fact, all of the short-term points that the panel has raised, the question of fascism, the question of white supremacy, the, all of these, these immediate questions. But I also think that there needs to be a fundamental change in the assumptions about the nature of the United States and its relationship to the populations within this country. Mm -hmm. And that is not a we. Mm -hmm. This is not a we. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is, the United States is an imperialist state not only because of what it does in 
around the world, but what it does right here. And it has a colonial relationship with black people who've been enslaved inside this country in terms of the, what, what is now called institutionalized racism. But it is a colonial relationship. It is also a colonial relationship with the brown people who are inside of this country. And when that social, economic, political relationship is, is teased out, then you begin to look at how those various systems re react and relate, not only in terms of what happens inside with those populations of people, but also in terms of, of, of our white allies and comrades who are part of the, the, what might be called the oppressor nation. And so it is not our communities that are safe, it's your community that is safe. Mine has never been. I remember even in being 15 years old on Long Island and the murder of Larry Blaylock in Roosevelt, Long Island, when we resisted. So this question of the, the role of the police has always and forever been the role of an occupying force. And when we resisted, then they brought the drugs in, the, velvet, the iron fist and the velvet glove. There is a direct relationship between the question of drugs coming into the country and its use. The same way there were the opium wars in China, there's the drug war here. Moving on. Um, so that this question of mercenaries and how the impact of the US military in Afghanistan, same thing here. You got folks who are going over there because they can't find a job here. So they'll agree to be a mechanic and make hundreds of thousands of dollars to be a mechanic or in, in, in connected with the US military where they would never consider that before, but they could not find a job here, so they considered going, and what we, they're called, what here? Contractors. No, they're mercenaries. <coughs> mercenaries. Last, third point. Uh, Anti-war, we got to get past fighting against systems, mechanized systems or weapon systems. I worked for American Service Committee. At that time, in the mid 80s, it was the B-50, first it was the B-50 to Obama. Oh, we got to go against the B-50 to Obama. Then it was whatever the latest nuclear weapons, whatever, whatever. Now it's drones. It is simply the latest development of technology. We got to oppose all of it. As Glenn Ford said, it, the, the weapon systems develop out of the development of technology of imperialism. If you don't deal with this question of this cause of this thing in the first place, you're going to be running after system after system after system after system. You're going to have an anti-war movement that's going to raise the latest country, the latest this, the latest that, but you haven't dealt with the, with, with, with the crux of it. And this is why people call this the, the beast here. Um, please. And this, this panel did not make the mistake. I want to raise this point. I want to raise it for the entire conference. They are not simply just young black men who are being shot down the street. They are young black men, women, and children. Mm -hmm. There are lists and lists of ch women who are being shot down in the streets and nobody is talking about it. There are men, women, and children. Do not <coughs> fall into the kind of patriarchal thinking, the divide and conquer thinking that is being projected out here. And lastly, again, I, I, I intentionally started with a thank you for the panel and, and clearly agree with many of the points. However, change in the difference in a perspective in terms of the view of how do we deal with the nature of the United States. But however, even in this conference, even in this panel, the composition of this panel, the composition of this panel, I don't doubt any sincerity, please understand where I'm coming from. But to be the spokesperson for Stop and Frisk, where are the young black men on this panel? We are the people well, who we are did in, We did I invite a Reverend Seku and he couldn't make it. I, I, I understand the intention, the, but the, the, the end result is that mm -hmm. the composition of the panel mm -hmm. still is not reflective mm -hmm. 
But may I add that when I agreed to be on the panel, my understanding was that Reverend Seku was on the panel. But that's one person out of four, and please don't be defensive about the point I'm making. I am not doubting their sincerity, the experiences, okay, the thought put into analyzing your experience, your courage. No question about that at all. But I do raise that when we walk in here and we're talking about the globalization of the police force, state terror, the victims, the actual continuing daily victims of that state terror, whether it's within the so-called U.S. borders or outside the border, they're not, they don't, their voice is not here, okay? And that is not a criticism of you individually. It's a criticism of how, when people talk about the anti-war movement, it's got to be, we've got to deal with the crux of the matter and, that, and make space for the voice of the people who are actively being being uh, uh, affected, and when that comes forward, when those people come forward, then that question of who's out in the street, who's out in the street gets addressed. Those people, that's who will lead that and, and set the tone and the direction. Again, this is not a personal criticism. It's not a criticism of courage. I, I, I applaud it. I respect it. I thank you for it and for the good information that you have put forward. 